Hello and welcome to episode 130 of Kaiju Curry House. I'm your host Paul, joined today by regular co-host Joe, and we have both Lindsay and Stuart from Dark Rift Horror. Welcome everyone, how are you doing? Hey, great, thanks man, thanks for having yeah. us back on, yeah. Thank yeah, you. thanks for coming back. It's Wouldn't been, um, it's been, been, been about a year since you were last here. Yeah, yeah, that's been a while. <laughs> yeah, it was just, I think you were... It's been a hot minute, that's for sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was, yeah, How to Kill Monsters was, was on Kickstarter at the time. Wow. So it was the, the beginning of that journey. Yeah, and now we've filmed the whole thing and it's yeah. pretty much there. It's almost finished. So yeah, oh man, it's been a long road. Yeah. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Well, we're definitely going to look forward to an update of how to kill monsters and talk about book of monsters and and everything else um but before we go into that i'm gonna start off and ask joe um, and what have kaiju been up to okay so joe has been trying really hard to avoid spoilers for godzilla minus one which is coming to uk cinemas on december the 15th which i'm really stoked about so please don't send me anything um i did end up watching the netflix gamera series um it ended up being quite different than what the initial 10 minutes let on. Um, it uh, felt like in the beginning it was going to start as a little bit more cutesy than uh, ended up, it ended up being, which I'm grateful that it went darker. Um, that's more details for another episode. And yeah, just generally been uh, reading some Project Nemesis literature after our latest interview. But yeah, that's been me, you know, relatively uh, busy in the monster world, considering. But I'm going to fire back and say, Lindsay, what have you been up? What have Kaiju been up to? Well, we've been on a, a bit of a festival run tour uh, around the US. So we've seen a lot of amazing US, eh? some features. Yeah, so we went to um, Orlando, uh, Ohio and Utah um so we've had to come ohio on. known for its crazy monster shenanigans <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was really cool so we went to nightmares film festival spooky empire and um film quest um so yeah they were we had a fantastic time didn't we it was yeah it was really cool like the um and we watched some good films too some amazing speaking films. of monster movies we saw um a really good found footage horror called frogman oh yeah uh frogman so yeah, awesome. it's about the uh, the. It's not the a famous... frog guy. It's a guy in a wetsuit, right? No, no, it's a frog, frog man. man. Oh <laughs> my gosh! Yeah. And it it, 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 it it based on a real legend. I'm not sure the. I can't remember the. Exact... I don't think that this is a real legend. Come yeah, yeah. There's a now. there's a town in America yeah. that has, has a frog. A frog. That doesn't make it any better when you <laughs> see that. So it's this, um... this by any chance or no? Florida was this Florida frog man? I might have been. I don't I know, don't but know, it's either. it's they they it's a found footage movie and the this guy who was a kid who saw a frogman on a family holiday and captured it on his camcorder wants to kind of recapture the fame that he got around that and he goes back to the town with his girlfriend and his friend to try and find the frogman and it goes 18 rated full crazy madness it is hilarious and gory and you need to check it out it was amazing yeah, it was really good. absolutely seriously writing frogman down on my list yeah, of things do to it see. it was such a hidden gem like yeah. that because we just i saw the name and i was like oh it's a creature feature i've got to see it and i was just like grinning all the way through so people who are listening to this right now are going to be like is this film out can i see it somewhere did you get any details or am i gonna it's, have to research this yeah so at the moment it's just touring film festivals uh so it was just at film quest in utah with us um, I know they're looking at game distribution. I'm not sure if that's finalized or anything, but I'm sure if you check it out on IMDb and, and follow the filmmakers, you'll be able to find out when it's screening next. It's, it's, I think it's at the same stage as our film right now. So it's, it's doing festivals, but I'm just from watching it, I'm a hundred percent positive it's going to get a uh, digital and Blu-ray release some, at some point early next year at the very least. Brilliant. Any distributors listening? <laughs> you know, we've got some good ones for you lined up here wow yeah. frog man it was awesome yeah it was, it was good <laughs> that is crazy oh so you yeah. just get to see so many cool films like that in the festival circuit and it's yeah. just like how like how how could i find a like find these films how do i find these gems like that? we need to go on a tangent here where's the film festival for horror and monsters in the uk um 
you've got quite a few. So Fright Fest in London in August is like your big one. That one is uh, over the August Bank Holiday weekend. It's like five days long. It's in Cineworld Leicester Square and it takes over like four, three or four screens. And you've just got constant horror movies for the whole five days. So we we had our world premiere for How to Kill Monsters there, which was awesome. So we actually, the first time we screened the movie for an audience was on an IMAX size screen, which wow. was insane. Yeah. Uh, we, we were so nervous, but it was really cool to see. Yeah. Lots of blood and monsters on a big screen. Um, that one's fantastic. There's a, a relatively new one that's about three, four years old called Dead Northern in York, which is where we, we live. Um, the guy, Gareth and Josh, who run that one, um, have really every year we've gone because we're local anyway so we just go as a ten like general film uh film fans mm-hmm. um but we got to go as filmmakers this year and it's just it's so good and like good family atmosphere really welcoming but they had some cracking films this year as well um and yeah there's there's a lot popping up isn't there we went mm-hmm. to dead and sudbury which is in sudbury mm-hmm. um in suffolk we went to uh, Dead of Night Film Festival in Southport, which is a really fun, smaller scale one. Mm. Um, and the great thing about festivals, I think it's it's a it's a quite a unique thing. You'll see a lot of movies at festivals that unfortunately never get a a wide release on digital or on physical because they might be quite low budget. They might not have quite mm. hit the 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 kind of marketing that the distributors want because a lot of them are just looking to tick boxes uh these days unfortunately it's all based on what's good for the google algorithm we'll buy this movie um but we've seen some great stuff so i, I heartily recommend try and visit some of these film festivals if you like horror movies because you'll see stuff that you might never see again and you'll be one of like if you feel like you're part of an exclusive club where you're like i saw this amazing movie that Unfortunately, no one else has got to see. And sometimes they come out like five, ten years later, which is crazy. So, like, we've seen stuff that we saw stuff like five years ago mm. that's finally coming out, and we just haven't really been able to talk about these things until now. So, yeah, really recommend going to some horror fests. Yeah. Great. I'm surprised that that like August is like when the big one takes place because you'd think that would totally be an October half term thing. I I know why they do it. It's because um a lot of festivals want to have like the world premiere of a movie. Yeah. So by putting themselves first, they kind of guarantee that. <laughs> they do have a Halloween event as well. They so do. they do have a second event in, in Halloween weekend. Yeah, because I think they were the UK premiere last year for the Winnie the Pooh Blood and Honey film. So they, they're kind of the big yeah. premieres for stuff. I yeah. saw that in HMV the other day. Is it good? I we still not seen, seen it. it. <laughs> My son was just like Dude, 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 we need to see this. I'm like, it's 18, mate. <laughs> I've heard it's pretty gory and brutal. So. We did watch the Friday night or Five Nights at Freddy's, though. Um, oh, yeah, we need to see that yeah, still. We yeah, that. we need to see it. Okay, so our boy, um, he's obsessed with, with this franchise, right? And I'm not going to lie. I know what the characters look like. And he's talked at me about the lore. But, you know, like when I watched the film, I was like, you know, I had low expectations, but this was a lot better than I was going to expect it to be. And from what I've seen, um, critics hated it. They hate all horror movies, but um, audience scores were through the roof with it. And it actually outperformed the super Mario movie in its opening weekend, you know, oh, if wow. it compare opening weekends of the States at least. So right. I was pretty like, Oh wow, this is cool. But I remember watching it, you know, as a, you know, like person who went to Chuck E. Cheese back in the day. <laughs> and it's just like, they've kind of nailed this. This is like, wow, this is pretty crazy. But um, yeah, like, I just, there's a lot of stuff going on right now. But the Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey, there was that and Cocaine Bear. And I was looking at both of them. But because all the kids were with us, I was just like, another <laughs> cocaine bear was fun we went yeah, to see that yeah, it's, yeah. it's it doesn't go as far as i'd hoped it'd be because again i think a lot of movies these days and i think five nights of freddy's is the same they've got to kind of keep that pg-13 rating so they can get the kids in yeah um so whenever someone's about to get the head bitten off it kind of cuts away or someone screams don't they like megan megan was, megan was a big one where we went to see that thinking oh this could be so much fun like chucky and it's like anytime like someone's about to get their head chopped off it kind of cuts away or something and it's like commit to the absurdity of this idea this is a stupid idea i want to see how stupid it can get <laughs> so though i think cocaine bear is like a hard r isn't it 
I don't know. It didn't feel like. I don't work. think you can get away with. I mean, like cocaine's in the title. Is it really going to be PG thirteen? I don't know. It just. It, it, I think it, is. it was I think probably tame for me. Or an it was tame for me. <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> it was yeah, a rain yeah. eighteen. So you no, know. Um, <laughs> that that blood and honey thing, like that, was so farcical. I was just like, gotta put that on the list. But yeah, yeah that'll be up there with Frogman now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> on the list of crazy movies to see. Yeah. Oh man! All right, there we go. We're we're mining for gold right now on the if nothing else, Paul. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we're never going. We, we have to progress this along. We need to talk about the movies. <laughs> All right, someone's got to pick on Paul now. Who's going to ask? Uh, Paul, what have card you been up to? Oh, well done. Nicely delivered. There we go. <laughs> um, right. So yeah, it's been Godzilla Day recently. The um, the, we could do a whole thing about that, so I won't go too much into it. But the um, the short they did was really cool. The new trailer for Minus One was really cool. There was loads of merch, but it was in America, so I missed out there. Hey ho! Um, it's also been my birthday recently. I got a few goodies, kind of related goodies. So um, I've got a, a Godzilla IDW big old. You get the book there, Volume One, the library collection. I think I'm really three. proud of. You're starting to just gravitate towards books naturally, Paul. Yeah, and look, look I, I got a, a, my first ever manga, Kaiju well, number eight. Kaiju number eight. You're gonna have to tell me how that is. They're making that into something like a film or something. Yes, I think it's um, someone's bought the rights, haven't they, to release a, a film? Yeah. And I thought, oh, I'll give that a shot. So yeah, I, and I've never read a manga before. I've just watched anime. So yeah, Joe, you're turning me into a reader. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> 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 but yeah, other than that not a huge amount um but i think that's enough because we really want to be talking about book of monsters and how to kill monsters <laughs> so i suppose we should start off with how to kill monsters how has that been going really good yeah we're really pleased with uh because we yeah world premiere in in august mm -hmm. and it's been like non-stop film festival since which has been it's the best possible thing you want as a filmmaker because the film festivals the and yeah the festival season is like the make it or break it for the early kind of buzz for the movie because you want to you want to get the getting into festivals alone is really good mm. getting awards at festivals is even better and then getting good reviews out of it is also good and luckily we've had all three which has been amazing yeah and we just yeah every screen we go to we just meet people who have just been super positive about the movie um and yeah people seem to really like what we've made which is the again as an artist that's the the thing that you know makes it all worth it because when people go oh my god i love this and i love that and they name all the fun things that you know you spent two years slaving away on and sweating and bleeding over like it's like yes we did it okay so yeah we're just um yeah really overjoyed at the response and i uh, the good thing that the other thing that's been really nice is a lot of people going oh my god like i love book of monsters but this was even better and i'm like great because that's always what you want to you always want to elevate and kind of improve as a filmmaker. Uh, it'd be terrible if people were like, Book of Monsters was way better. Way better. <laughs> like, that would be, it's like, oh, we've taken a step backwards, have we? Okay. Um, so yeah, that's really been nice. And it, it was just, it's just been great fun because we've kind of always said that all our films are like um, getting the family back together to work together again. So it was just been a good excuse to get everyone back playing different characters, which has been good um and have fun making monsters because that's what we love doing <laughs> there we go i was gonna say i have to see this this film because i mean first of all it's gonna be interesting but i still remember a year ago when we did our first interview blood cannons became a thing in my mind <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and i'm just like not to see how they use that oh yeah so yeah i mean like so when we're talking about buzz on the uh circuit um Obviously, I'm not going to ask about any specific scenes or whatnot, but how did how did um, usually films have a first, second, and third act? Mm -hmm. So, what were audience reactions most positive towards in that sense? Was like like you know like oh you did a great slow build or you know like middle acts are notoriously like slow and boring for some films. It's just like oh the pacing was great, which is usually you know the sign of a great middle act hmm. or you know in the third like oh the climax was amazing so what kind of feedback what kind of buzz did you get in that regard because horror films i feel more than anything else perhaps you know thriller you can 
bring in but most horror films have an element of thrill too don't they but how did like horror films you know that that can kind of be on shaky ground depending you know like how the director and the writing went how was the reaction for that i mean it's been really good because mm -hmm. ours is what, what we learned from our la our first two films creature below and book of monsters is a lot about pacing um like book of monsters like reflecting on it and i'm, I'm very happy to be openly critical about previous work because I'm where you know we see every film as a learning experience I think Book of Monsters has <clears throat> kind of it gets better as it goes along it starts out quite slow it's a very slow build then the monsters show up and then chainsaws get involved and it gets more exciting um but the opening to the film I think you know whenever I have to watch it again and I say I have to watch it again because sometimes we'll go to screening and I you know you, you start to kind of you, you can see your own stuff too much and you you see only the negatives but I think when me and Paul Butler, who's the co-writer and my collaborator at Dark Rift Horror, were kind of coming up with How to Kill Monsters, we were like, okay, this film needs to open in the most exciting, cool way possible, and then that needs to keep going and going and going <laughs> throughout. So kind of the way we approach the How to Kill Monsters is it's very much like an episodic kind of adventure where every sequence... We bring in a new monster, some crazy gory stuff happens, and then you have a maybe like two minutes to catch your breath, and then there's another sequence with blood and monsters and stuff. And that's been the comment that's been the most kind of nice to hear is that people are like, oh my God, it's just relentless, and there's a lot of twists and turns, and it always keeps you guessing. Because roller coasters, the word that you usually get thrown out. At the yeah, yeah. Something it's, like that. It's uh, the nicest compliment I got was like it's it's um, Sam Raimi esque madness mixed made by brain dead era Peter Jackson, which I was like, I'll take that as a huge compliment. Wow, that is that is high praise. That really <laughs> yeah. is. So and because brain dead, I just love that movie. It's just once that gets going, it's crazy, especially that kind of final act. Has so Peter Jackson made a bad film? <sighs> Don't think he has. I mean, the Hobbit films get a bit. Okay, we can forgive him for that. Yeah. He yeah, I mean, I'll really forgive him for anything. Ring. He made the Lord of the Rings. I don't care what he does. Like he did the perfect trilogy, so you know. Yeah. So the Hobbit, I have to defend him. <laughs> he did not want to make it that bloated thing that it became. Oh yeah, yeah. No, that was all. There was an enormous amount of pressure. So the yeah. first one, the first three, he had to fight to make them three. Yeah. The Hobbit, which is one very short book, he had to fight. He was trying to fight to contain it. I just yeah. find that so hilarious yeah the making of that film is kind of more interesting than the actual trilogy i think if you <laughs> delve into the youtube of the behind the scenes and there's that great kind of bit of it where peter jackson's just sat depressed and they're all just like let's just let's just cancel the shoot for a while peter needs to like not go crazy we need to figure out how we're going to do this because it's just like it, yeah but that's for all films is like that behind the scenes really <laughs> <laughs> we just all pretend it went were there mental breakdowns and monsters oh, all the time every day every day because you know monsters uh monsters are big prima donnas they don't always act the way you want them to <laughs> they don't always you know uh eat people when on command you've got a game being a famous example yeah yeah exactly <laughs> um so anytime you work with practical effects it takes longer than you think and sometimes things don't work out you know exactly how you want it sometimes they do and it's great and everyone's like yes because the buzz you get of like we say with last time with the blood cannons the buzz you get of a great blood cannon scene and it the blood splats in everyone's face the way you want and it hits the wall and the limbs go flying you're like that is Lindsay's face right here and you know it's just like you're describing like, how would it hit someone's face and she's just nodding like Yep. yeah yeah the, the flashbacks <laughs> that i'm getting getting yeah. stays kicking in Yep. <laughs> how, many, how many how many blood cannon takes were there? Can, can you put a number to that? Too no, many. <laughs> too many. Yeah. In fact, actually, the blood we didn't use the blood cannons that much. I think mm. what I had more it's on this film. Point now, come on, you didn't have to tell me that. Yeah, it's more buckets. It's on more this buckets. One. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's actually the volumes more in this film. Um, as yeah, I literally had a bucket of blood like poured over me. Um, so yeah, the blood cannons. They obviously shoot out a lot, you know, a fair amount of blood, but the buckets obviously pour out a lot more. And I got a lot more of the bucket. But yeah, I think for the length of shoot that we had, um, I'm not exaggerating when I say this, there was only three days where I didn't have blood on me. And 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 bearing in mind, it was a 33 day shoot. 
<laughs> so you can get an idea of the volume of blood that's in this movie. So, like, leaving set. So, uh, who who was it? So, uh, we'll use Lord of the Rings as an example. Viggo Mortensen, famous for just leaving set in full Aragorn regalia, sword and everything, just walking around. <laughs> so, like, when you're leaving set, and, you know, like, you're painted red, do people look at you funny? Or did, or was there like a place where you know you could get changed and you know like normalize yourself for re-entering society? Yeah, I mean we were fortunate to film um, in some studios, so um, we were parked reasonably close. It was like you know we just had to cross the road to get to the car park. So if we were running late and there wasn't enough time to wipe all the blood off, I would wipe as much as I could off my face and my hands and then put a jacket on so you couldn't see it over my wow. arms so I was able to hide it a bit I would just be very pink yeah <laughs> in the face people, like, yeah, people would be like oh she's got a very strange did you ever like did you ever like decide to like roll the dice and just walk out in like full gore maiden and just be like don't go in there you know, like, you ever do yeah. that? I would not We were not her. allowed to yeah, do that. Because... There was, I had a significant amount of blood on me. It yeah. wasn't subtle. The, poli <laughs> the police would have been there so yeah. quick because we were in the city centre. That would have been great buzz generation, to be fair. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was, um, yeah, there was a lot. It was, I think what was fun, well, funny now to look back on that we had to do is the amount of pictures that I had on my phone to make sure that continuity was the same every day. Yeah, you got to have like that one spec there or whatever. Yeah, yeah, because I think when when you do the blood cannon shot or the bucket of blood, you know, you have that done to you and then you think, oh, no, I'm going to have to have to have this much blood reapplied every single yeah. day now moving forward. So it was trying to keep that continuity. And I think that's one thing that we actually did really well. There's, you know, we, we ended up being able to keep that very consistent. I mean, to be honest, a lot of the time it was just get a load of blood and pour it all over your face um, because there was just that much. <laughs> Continuity is so important. So completely unrelated film, Falling for Christmas on Netflix with Lindsay Lohan. It is a Hallmark movie to the nines, right? I have two girls. We watch these films. But anyways, um, there's a point where Miss Lohan, you know, like she falls over a chair and you know, it's a recliner. So it falls over with her and she tears down a drape. But she's trying to catch herself. And like, we we're all just like, geez, someone's going to kill herself. And like, no one's even going to know because she's in a room alone. Someone bursts in like, I heard a fall and a crash. And like, you turn over and you see her. Lindsay's like lying on the floor there. But miraculously, the chair is upright and the curtain is still on the rungs where two seconds ago. <laughs> It hadn't been. And everybody in the room, regardless of age, caught that. And we were all like, hmm. So, like, yeah, continuity is a big thing. We've had um, we we had a CGI manager for the Marvel movies come on a while back. And one of the more interesting things that she pointed out is that in some of the new Marvel films, because they're going at such a breakneck pace nowadays, that you'll see in the digital creatures and the scenery and whatnot, shadows are not in the right places. Huh. or shadows are not there and she says that's the kind of thing that drives people nuts but again like obviously we know a giant tentacled walking eye eyeball is not existing <laughs> but it certainly doesn't help that the sun is on is in the right and the shadows are also in the right yeah. you know, like on the right side of the creature so it, it's these things but yeah like blood is such a thing you'll have perfectionists like me and i'm waiting for someone to do it in a film where like someone gets a blood can to the face or whatever, cleans themselves up, you know, in like the downtime in between monsters, say, <laughs> and like they miss a spot on their cheek so as to drive the audience absolutely nuts, you know, like they clean their face with the exception of like this one bit on their nose or whatever. And like that just continues. But if like you didn't, like there are audience members that do catch these things. So yeah, makeup, very important. Sorry to go on a tangent. But it's huge. <laughs> People notice that stuff. It is, it is very true. Um, and yeah, luckily we had yeah India who was on makeup, kind of catching all that stuff. And then Lindsay, I think the actors as well were very good at keeping an eye on their own kind of continuity because um, it, it really is a team effort with this stuff because everyone wants the film to be good and like not have any mistakes. So that always helps. Um, but sometimes, you know, if there is a continuity error, 
it's on purpose because you're like, actually, it looks better that yeah. you're, you know, we had funny times with the script supervisor down where I would like um, kind of make fun of him because he'd be like, oh, Stuart, in the last take, her, when she hit the floor, her hair like fell here, but it's falling here. And I'm like, yeah, but I like it better that way. And no one's going to notice that strand of hair after I've intercut a million shots of tentacles flipping around. In you know, like you're, you're, you're on a podcast now with thousands of listeners. And I mean, like, you've totally ruined it. People are going to know now. <laughs> I challenge we'll, them. We'll look out for it now. I challenge yeah, this is me thank you. Special yeah. features. <laughs> We changed it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is why, this, again, this is why we do the festivals first. I know it's all the problems. Yeah. And then when we get the Kickstarter Blu-rays out and the digital copy out, they'll all be fixed. <laughs> and you and people who saw it at the festivals, they'll be the only people who saw that version of the movie. <laughs> there we go. So speaking of the Kickstarter, you've got a couple of backers here on the podcast with you. Um, very curious to see to know when we might see this film coming out on Blu-ray and whatnot. I understand that things may still be in the works, but do you have a roundabout time frame? Yeah, uh, and well, firstly, thank you guys so much for backing it because this is this is the thing: is the the films we make very specific type of low budget monster movie, and we make them well a because we're fans of that stuff, but b because we know there's other fans of it, and these aren't the these aren't the type of movies on our scale that are gonna get major Hollywood funding. These are passion projects made by people who just love it. So yeah, we really kind of love the fact that there is a community around here that supports our crazy stuff and likes the craziness as much as we do, which is great. Um, so yeah, we've obviously the festivals was the first step. I'm working on the Blu-ray every day. Lindsay's chipping away at all the behind the scenes. Um, we've obviously got the comic book as well, mm -hmm. which is coming together really well. The video game, which I played the full version of just before we went on the festival tour, uh, which is so much fun to play. It's so spoilerific, though, so you must watch the film before you play the game. That's oh, one thing. I, I'm going to stick a spoiler sticker on the box. So do not play this until... <laughs> and I think it's going to have to be the same for the comic book, actually. It's a weird one. You're going to have to watch them in a certain order, which is quite fun, because um, the film's got a lot of twists and turns. But, yeah, we're, we the, the original aim was um, aiming for Christmas. I'm still trying to make that target. The main yeah. thing for me is what I'm saying to everyone. I'm like... I'd rather have it perfect. I don't want to rush it. If it's going to take a bit longer time, I'll let everyone know. Hey, if but we ultimately, Christmas, that's my Valentine's Day sorted. You know, I'm a romantic like that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So it's like, I don't, because this is the thing that we've learned over, over the years is once that film is out on digital and it's out on Blu-ray, that is the version that will exist for all time. Well, until your Blu-ray melts apart in like a thousand years or something. I don't know how long they actually last. Something to look at. Uh, but we want it to be the right version. And there's a lot of testing that goes into, into that. And, and the, this is the thing that I think, I, can, I put a post about this, but this is the thing that's the, the most time consuming thing is testing the film on every potential kind of bad, poorly calibrated television that people have because <laughs> my parents for example they have all those terrible factory settings on the tv where the contrast is bad there's that weird motion flow thing and it's like i can't assume that everyone has actually calibrated their tv and how to kill monsters is set all entirely at night time with lightning and all sorts of cool effects and it's it quite sounds dark. like the 2014 godzilla film like <laughs> it's not know. as bad as that don't worry yeah, it's not that bad. we all love that film on this podcast let's be real here for a moment but like it was dark way too dark yeah, way oh, yeah. too dark but this is the thing is like we've the film's all like it looks great on the cinema screen with a projector with like the brightest bulb ever it does not look great on a tiny tv right now so what we're trying to do is make sure it looks good because we need to almost get a good average so that it looks great on like everyone's tvs which is honestly weirdly a, more of a challenge than you think because when we think we've got it i take it around to my parents house watch it like why can you not see this scene what what is wrong with your television so I it's a story to share on that line so <laughs> so my stepdad he's a lovely bloke and he only updates a television or you know a bit of, a bit of kit only when he has to so his television bit the dust oh 12 years ago something like that and i was working at a best buy which for our uk audience is kind of the equivalent of a curry's pc and i was in the home theater department and so dennis comes in and he's just like joe load me up i want the best stuff because i'm not going to do this again for like another 10 years so make it good 
and we got him kitted out. We got him 7.1 surround sound, you know, like the, the big plasma TV plasma is better for darks. That's the way it was at least 10 years ago, you know? So we got him plasma TV so that he can eat because he normally watches at night anyways. So all the darks were perfect. We got it, you know, so that it would fit inside of like his little cupboard that he had to keep all this stuff. And then we get home and I must have spent, you know, two hours setting this up and everything. And what does he pull out to test it? A v- a, a stereo VHS copy, a Top Gun. <laughs> his rationale, his rationale was like, oh, the beginning of Top Gun. You can hear like all the things like the clips and, you know, like the wheels catching the tarmac and everything. <laughs> I'm just like no <laughs> so i remember just being so indignant i drove back to the store spent five dollars because the five it, it top gun you know it was five dollars for the blu-ray to yeah. get it and i'm like okay mate here's why you got it and i just remember like his face <laughs> you know because like 7.1 like when that like that was like theater only you know type stuff yeah. And like what we also did, and, and like my mom was just like, "What the hell are you doing?" We cranked the volume on that sucker too. <laughs> so it was just like my mom was in the kitchen, like, "What is going on?" It's like World War Three in here. But you know, it, it is a thing. Like when you're watching a film, you have to have you have to take the stuff into account. And like Godzilla 2014 has taught us, you know, like that is a thing. Other films, I think that you know, a lot of Hollywood films have taken a bashing lately because of how it, it's either they're sepia toned or they have a bluish tone to everything there's no in between there yeah like they just love those two shades and like films either fall into one of those two categories i mean godzilla 2014 was just gray but we we have that and you you do need a monitor and kudos to you for like actually catching that and doing something about it (laughs) i'm gonna ask you to talk again Lindsay. i want to know is there gonna be a bloopers reel here Yes, there was. Oh, yeah. Last time we were on, there were there was a threat, and you know, there's thre- the threatening of a scene where Kate tries to eat somebody, if I'm remembering <laughs> correctly. Yeah. And there better be bloopers for that. <laughs> better be. <laughs> oh, there is. Oh, well, I ended up being the the creature performer inside this cake monster. You're the cake. Oh, and, wow. uh, it's uh, yeah. There's a little Easter egg for you because I don't think that's in the credits. But um, yeah, I'm not. I'm not the most. Um, the cake as itself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just the cake. You're, you're not... still messing with the Blu-ray. You can do that. You yeah, know? yeah. But I'm no, I'm no Doug Jones. I'm not like a very spry person. So I'm, I almost did my back in doing that. <laughs> the monster performance. It's a, and there's a lot of, yeah. There's a lot of bloopers of just me poking my head out, just covered in sweat, going, "Is it done? Is it done?" It looks so, like the cake is giving birth to me. That'll be it? one of the bloopers. That's very Ace Ventura 2. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's, that's what I'm picturing. Yeah. That's a, we <laughs> yeah. all immediately went there. Wow. <laughs> so when you make a cake monster, and I feel I have to ask this, do you put like legitimate icing on the top of the cake to like give it that added realism? You know, so when someone's you presumably someone puts up a fight when a cake's trying to eat them, right? So like <laughs> is, is, there, is there like icing? Like, I don't know. No, no, there was no real icing on it because um, there's health and safety. There, there's loads of boring reasons why you can't really use like. Real I mean, I know icing is bad for me, but that seems ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those boring things where it's like that cake had to sit around a lot in between takes, and if we'd have put anything oh, yeah. fresh cream on it, it would have just got. So, like the the cream of the cake, the frosting is shaving foam. Okay, so like so, that's. Like, for so yeah there's stuff like that yeah it's again i don't want to spoil it i, yeah. I, I, no, I don't, no, don't spoil it no, but you know it's asking it's a practical effect bit that i was curious about so um, that brings me on to another question who is health and safety on your picture and <laughs> what kind of metal are you giving them in a thing where like people get blasted by blood cannons like if someone got hurt in this film how do they know <laughs> <laughs> Well, a lot of risk assessments happen uh, before we we set step on set. So, like, we have to, which is funny because when you're doing the risk assessment, you're like, okay, I've got to risk assess a blood cannon being fired at someone's face, and then we use um, an external company to do that, and they're like, what 
that I just get messages all the time. What what is this? Wait, some of those messages are some of those messages on the special features? No, unfortunately, <laughs> they're, they're, they're pri- they, I mean, they are kind of confidential private emails between us and the company, so I can't really just. Say I know, it. I know, but like that would be absolutely <laughs> hilarious. It's just funny. like Susan in the risk assessment team has a question. <laughs> so you seem to be doing an excessive amount of blood cannon firing at faces. Are they going anywhere else, or is it just the face? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. funny when they they don't understand. Sometimes they really don't comprehend, or they didn't give us enough benefit of the doubt to think that we are actually safe people. So sometimes they're like, "So you've got a scene where the chainsaw's getting." rammed into someone's chest like how are you going to do that safely i'm like it's not a real chainsaw you do realize this right and they're like oh well what is it then and i was like well it's you know it's wood bike chain is all sorts of bits it's not actually spinning that is an effect in post-production and they were like oh oh and you could see they were slowly realizing that this is this is how films are made because <laughs> they don't always deal with that type. I don't think they I've ever dealt with someone making the type of film we were making. So it was like, yeah, how are you going to have someone get eaten by a monster? Cause the teeth are quite sharp, you know? And I was like, <laughs> don't worry. They're not real teeth. It's not a real monster. <laughs> so this was this, this is again a thing. So we've been lucky enough to have some folks who've worked on the original Jurassic park on the podcast. And, um, you know, we were kind of talking behind the scenes when we were recording, like the T-Rex, the animatronic T-Rex for Jurassic Park, arguably one of the most famous animatronics of all time. One of the lar- largest and most expensive props of all time. Yeah. And that uh, animatronic was designed so it could pick a person up. And indeed in the Lost World, an animatronic does pick someone up. And then in the, in the third one, the Spinosaurus picks someone. And I was always under the impression that those were like acrylic teeth, you know, like they were hard. Um, something similar like the uh, alien, the alien queen, like she had acrylic teeth. Paul, yeah. being the alien fan, will tell you that like the mini mouth that comes out actually punched out all of her front teeth because someone pushed the wrong button. And they had to <laughs> hunt around for these clear teeth. <laughs> but um, there are sp- like there were like all sorts of special rigs, and indeed like the teeth could be swapped out on the animatronic. So it's just, it's really cool getting into this stuff, but yeah, health and safety in a film where everything's killing everything. I mean, did they ever come to the uh, set or was it all like email or? No, that, I don't think they ever showed it once, which was great because mm. they probably would have had second thoughts. I think the most dangerous thing, <laughs> weird because the most dangerous thing was like the risk of slipping on yeah. blood. Because well, yeah, I was thinking that that must yeah, be really dangerous. It, it was, and and I was constantly being like the mother hen type figure, going, "No, Kev, right, wait, wait there, a second, no, no, watch it, watch it," like because people were like, "Whoa," yeah. all the time doing a comedy like, "Whoop," um, like banana slip because it just even when it dried it was still like really like sticky yeah. and but there'd be always be like that one patch yeah. of like fresh blood and you would just honestly it's like because that whatever solution they make it out of is quite slimy because mm. that that gives it quite a good kind yeah. of stringy look on fingers and things um yeah it just you just flew especially yeah. once we added the slime because we use slime whenever there's a monster with tentacles you want them to shine oh, yeah, have slime. So, have slime. yeah we had the slime on it um and that stuff really was just like you would just it doesn't dry either that stuff does not dry it stays yeah. flippy and but, sticky forever oh so i've got stuff in my garage in bin bags from book of monsters that is still gooey from that slime like from that's that's the tagline for this podcast say- episode paul that's the sound bite <laughs> at the end of the credits yes. <laughs> well the problem is this is the funny thing again about like latex and stuff is you don't want to like wash it too much because some of the materials they've used in the creatures like will just degrade. So it's like, I can't wash them, but I can keep the slime on it as long as it's airtight. If it's not airtight, it will go moldy. There's like keeping this stuff is almost impossible. So it's like once I open the bags, they will be, because I opened one from Creature Below like last year uh, and it was like the beak of the cthulhu type creature in the basement. And that was still had blood on it and slime, but it, it wasn't moldy or anything because it'd been airtight. Within a week, it was just covered in mold and it had to go. Oh. So it's like the health and safety of keeping the props is also another thing. You've got to like seal them in containers, get them properly cleaned and like covered in like a varnish if you want to like preserve them. And that yeah. just, yeah. It's funny on the behind the scenes as well when because of how sticky the floor would get, you could just hear people's shoes in the background of yeah. like the amount of takes where you literally have to... T- 
tell people you can't walk or anything because everyone's shoes because we had like shoe protectors um to put over people's shoes so that we weren't walking blood down the corridors um but obviously they would get stuck to the yeah. so it'd just be like was super there a janitor squelchy. at this place Did you guys was there a janitor that came around like after hours yeah yeah it oh, was no. felt awful you because there was just like we tried <laughs> we to even like a heroes or like a celebrations at the end of this right yeah yeah, yeah. yeah cuz it's oh that's a great so for listeners who are not British, <laughs> heroes are celebrations. They're like, you will have seen one because if you had a grandmother, she put all of her sewing kit in it. But um, they're like these plastic things you get at like a, a supermarket um, or grocery store if you're American. And they're just full of like little candies and treats. They're, they're great <laughs> you, for like office You don't get that in America. Do you not have a tub of sweets? On top of chocolate, like bags or like industrial sized boxes and things like that. I mean, like a, a little celebrations, like you know, like that. That's an afternoon ball. I mean, like, come on now, America. I, I assume they're everywhere. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, no. Like, so this poor person, did you like shake their hand at the end and say thank you? It was or, just a lot of apologizing, wasn't there? Yeah. Constantly, because it was about <laughs> there was about ten different cleaning staff who worked on that floor and. Honestly, the act we'd be telling people put the blue fabric shoes on so that you don't spread the blood in the corridor. And I would literally leave, and there would just be red footprints down. I'd go to the bathroom stall. There'd be blood on the mirror, blood on the sink, blood on the b- toilet. And I'd be like, "What? What have we been telling you people yeah. this whole time?" But the problem is, it sometimes it got on the blue bits, and then those went everywhere. And it was just like, yeah, I felt so bad for the cleaners, but I think they got a bit of a kick out of it because. They would obviously, they're so used to cleaning these studios out and they're just black spaces. And they would come in and there was body parts, especially like you'll see in the, we, when we did the Kickstarter trailer, that kind of cabin ritual scene. Um, that there was just body parts and blood dripping from the walls. And they were just like, what has happened in here? Yeah. They're like, we'll invite you to the screening when we get around to For it. Sure. Don't worry, yeah, we'll show sure. you. <laughs> I think as well, we used, um, a lot of the time, they'd use talcum powder to, try and dry out the blood mm. but because of the volume of blood it just became like a paste yeah so mm. i think that's why that also got stuck to the um the, the, the shoe coverings because and then that became really slippy because it was like a mixture of goo talcum powder and blood so yeah that yeah, as you said that probably was the biggest health and safety risk it took so long because i myself paul and a few other people had to like clean up the sets afterwards it took like a solid week of just mopping again and again to get the layers He's finding more blood of blood yeah. and then the walls as well how ironic the health and safety was for this film where you're just <laughs> gratuitous violence and killing things like i find that I find that dynamic just fantastic <laughs> it's uh yeah it's it's a ridiculous ridiculous way of doing things but yeah yeah yeah, when you see the film, you'll see why that that was the most. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was the biggest help. Well, we can't. Well, so we can't wait to see the film, um, but we will be waiting. Um, hopefully, for Christmas. If not, we'll just say Q one twenty twenty four. But we, I mean, I have seen Book of Monsters though. Woo! Was that filmed in the same place? I mean, like how how different is that to to how to kill monsters like on a, a scale wise a budget wise like how how much did it grow between the films it's i think book of monsters was filmed in a it's still in leeds but in a different studio space we mm. filmed book of monsters in prime studios um in leeds which is where a lot of a lot of stuff shot there actually and they did a really good deal for us and they were like look we've got this small studio you can have it for like a month so we built i know it was two weeks actually yes yeah, so weeks. book of monsters scale difference was we shot book of monsters in two weeks we shot how to kill monsters in over a month um book of monsters was probably about a third the budget maybe even a quarter of the budget of how to kill monsters wow. in total. Okay, quite... um because we had money in addition to the kickstarter there was previous investors who put money in as well because we really again book of monsters great learning experience wish we'd had more money because we really pushed everyone to the limit on that in terms of how much we could pay people and there was a lot of favors called in um so how to kill monsters was really like okay let's what here's what we could do with more money more time um and yeah hopefully it shows well at least it seems to be showing because yeah people seem to be commenting on the yeah it's a it's definite step up yeah. 
Um, but yeah, Book of Monsters was great because that was that was a much more kind of smaller scale project because we built the whole interior of the house in the studio. So you could walk from the kitchen set through the living room to the bedroom. And then we went on like a weekend location shoot to shoot all the exterior stuff. So when people are running around outside and in the farm setting, that was just one weekend. Um, so yeah, much simpler than How to Kill Monsters was because yeah, <laughs> How to really... Kill Monsters was a crazy shoot. It was. <laughs> oh, but so because I mean we've we've recently had Spooky Season, um, so it's the perfect time you know to watch because uh, uh, co- I confess I hadn't seen Book of Monsters. Um, but I funded How to Kill Monsters based just on the trailer and and the synopsis. Awesome. It sounded so good. Um, but me and my like um, my bestie Sally, we we always watch horror films together, and I was like. You know, let's let's watch Book of Monsters. I've already funded the next one. Let's see what it's all about. And I tell you, I haven't laughed out loud like that in quite a long time. Okay. It was it was brilliant. Like, it, it was creepy, but also funny and full of. I just absolutely adored that film. Um, yeah. Those those little gnomes. <laughs> it, yeah, they they just they just absolutely had me in stitches. Fantastic stuff. And I was thinking, God, so this is. It's not your first, that was your second film, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. But I, I kind of consider it as our first film of... It's your like, first film together, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, and it's like, I think that's when we really kind of found the type of movie we wanted to make. Yeah. Like, The Creature Below, um, it's, yeah, a very serious psychological horror movie. And even when we were making it, we were like, oh, this would be so funny if it had the tentacles attacking. It would be funnier if it was a comedy. But we were like, no, we're making a serious movie. <laughs> Because, you know, in your head, you're like, oh, I'm a filmmaker. I'm a serious filmmaker. It has to be a serious film. And then when we made that, we were like, no, we need to make a Sam Raimi-inspired, Edgar Wright-esque, crazy fun movie. Because we always, me and Paul always laugh about, oh, wouldn't it be funny if, like, these slugs, like, ate these garden gnomes and then the slugs gave birth to garden gnomes <laughs> and then they attacked this male stripper gram and they bite his groin and he's got to hit it with a band. That's kind of the silliness that we like. So, yeah, Book of Monsters was, we consider that kind of our first one of the monstery movies that we make yeah <laughs> good yeah so i was a- absolutely loved it um and so now so lindsay you're in both films very similar characters but completely unrelated yes yes yeah yes, you, just, yeah. you just like chainsaws yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah i'm just at, yeah just at one with chainsaws now I'm just yeah yeah every film now there will be a chainsaw <laughs> kind but yeah how to come monsters is more like a it's like a spiritual sequel. So yeah, it's a similar cast. Um, but everyone's playing completely different roles. Um, which was a lot of fun because as she was said at the beginning, like it was really nice to get the cast and a lot of the crew back together. Um, because we are like a little family and just to get everyone back on set was super fun. And to see people playing different roles as well was really uh really exciting um and a lot of fun to do. But yeah, it is it is a step up, definitely, I think. Um, but, I mean, Book of Monsters was a lot of fun to do. So Book of Monsters was my first feature film. Um, so I'll always have, like, a nice place in my heart because it was, like, <laughs> it was super fun to do. Um, but I had a lot of fun on How to Come Monsters. So, yeah. Just every film that we do with Dark Rift is just the best. It's just so much fun. Like, literally every day on set, it's just... Every, it's just that's why there's so many bloopers because, especially on How to Come Monsters, mm. there's just... Everyone's having such a good laugh um and just constantly yeah yeah the blooper reel will be really difficult to edit down because <laughs> there's oh, so funny. many so, people laughing yes is there a blooper reel for book of monsters as well yeah there is, there is a short one there yeah is, it's um, particularly long i think it's only about five minutes but there is there is one but yeah it's on the blu-ray it's on the blu-ray there we go oh, the- look at that yeah. now hey you said that didn't exist yet come on no book no monsters. book of monsters oh, <laughs> right 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 okay yeah, yeah. if you um <laughs> You can get it from darkrifthorror.com right now. Um, but oh, it has... Uh, we'll put in a link. Nice. Thank you. It's got a feature-length documentary, eight deleted scenes, an alternate ending, a gag reel, and uh, it is signed by Lindsay and myself. Ooh. Yeah. So pick one up. <laughs> yes. That's well, it. Yeah, everyone, put that on your wish list for Christmas. Sure. We'll that's that. the advert over. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Christmas started. There we go. Brilliant. Oh, so, th- so um, yeah, what... Okay, I now want to know what scene was the most took the most takes then for Book of Monsters. Was it one where you just couldn't stop laughing and they just had to redo it and redo it, or were the practical effects just did not play ball? They, 
probably the stripper <laughs> when the stripper gram turns up and he does the dance on me. Um, that took quite a few takes, but also I had that. I was very conscious of the fact that Aaron had to. I mean, Aaron's hilarious. He's just he's yeah, he's just so funny. So. Mm. Anything he does is just hilarious. Um, but I was very conscious that he had to do that scene in front of like 30 people with no music. So he had to do it in silence. Um, <laughs> and I, I knew that if I laughed, he'd have to do it again. So I was very conscious of like, <laughs> I cannot laugh. I just can't. But it was very difficult to not laugh. Um, but I think I think we did it in about three takes, I think. So I was quite pleased that I managed to get it, get it in three. Yeah, yeah. But more for Aaron's sake. Uh, but yeah, I had to hold in a lot, a lot of laughter. Um, but yeah, I think the most takes, maybe that, or maybe the finale scene. Apart from when all when I get all the blood and mm. the gunk thrown at me, obviously we have to get that in one take. Um, but yeah, the fight fighting the monsters can take a couple of a couple of takes, definitely. Uh, but I think because we only had two weeks on that shoot, it was very much like one or two takes every time because yeah. we just had to get through everything. Um, so we didn't kind of have the luxury of like, oh, let's do it again and let's get another take kind of thing, which, but I think everyone was so on board with, with the film and the characters yeah. and everything like that, that it didn't necessarily need it because you always found everyone just did really, really well in their roles. So, so yeah, but I think for the comedy side, I think the, the, the striptease was probably the most difficult to not <laughs> laugh <laughs> for me personally. Yeah. I think everyone knew as well that we, um, because we only had such a limited time and I was always so stressed out. They were like, just get it right on the first take because he'll be angry. <laughs> he, <laughs> so, never get, by the way, he never gets angry on set ever. So. I, I mean, I'm good at pretending yeah. to be really calm. Can you tell? Like, that's, that's what I I'm know really... that feeling. I know. Uh, <laughs> can see it in his eyes, but no one else knows. Yeah, you can tell <laughs> that can tell. Like, when I'm like raging inside, uh, someone will come up to me and go, oh, I'm really sorry, but we broke this thing. And I'm like, it's fine, don't worry about it. <laughs> I can see he's like crying inside. <laughs> But yeah, um, it's um yeah, I think yeah, practical effects days are always the hardest. There was yeah. one day when I think it's when that kind of big beast monster kind of first pops in and rips that guy in half and then starts like eating people left and right. We we filmed that on a separate day, so Lindsay wasn't there that day, even though they're reacting to it. We filmed yeah. everyone reacting to it and then the monster eating people like on a separate okay. day just because there was so much to do. There's yeah, like a girl who gets the guy it. with like the head on a stick going, rawr, rawr. <laughs> Yeah, it pretty was, much. It, it, was... it was literally Stuart's hand being like, right, okay, react to something here, yeah. react to something here. <laughs> so every time, yeah, the, the shot is on the actors responding to the monsters, it's just us screaming at absolutely nothing. Yeah. Because um, one of the actors, Aaron, who plays the stripper ground, was in the Beast monster costume as well. Yeah. But he's in the scene with it. So you're like, wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, like, it's, like... it's funny when we watch it, because we watched it recently, actually, because we mm. haven't watched Book of Monsters for, for a while. Um, and we did some pickup sh um, days that shoot that were like six months later. Yeah. It's really fun to watch because... Um, Stuart and has edited it so well and Hamish lit it so well that you can't tell at all that there's like a six month gap between some of these shots um, but it's, yeah, it's really fun for us to watch back and, and see those little yeah. bits but yeah the days with the monsters attacking us was particularly fun for me to watch at the premiere because I didn't know what was what I was reacting to obviously I knew what the monster looked like but I wasn't there on the day they killed yeah. a lot of the people so that was really fun to kind of watch everyone else's performances and see what I was actually screaming at <laughs> I didn't know <laughs> oh my lord oh, that's good. so you're editing how to kill monsters are you did you say and so uh, Stuart's editing the film I've, I've been editing the behind the scenes oh you've been doing the okay yeah, yeah. Especially yeah all the star updates that kind of where we've had like a yes. day 12 or something that's all Lindsay doing all that yeah um yeah. Yeah, and obviously, it kind of took a bit of a pause because we went to do all the festivals. Yeah, I know. So I feel awful. Got, I'm, I'm always like, when's that next video you know, going? Come on. I know. <laughs> yeah, because we, we were away for uh, over three weeks. But I think what has been really fun to edit the behind the scenes because, you know, it's great to just kind of relive it all because mm. it, it was basically people literally with a camera all day filming. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of footage to go through, but also trying to edit a non spoiler edits is really yeah. difficult trying to edit you know because we don't want to really reveal any of the monsters too much you know we don't obviously don't want to reveal anything anything mm. of the plot that that's happens the problem no, with like trailers and stuff these days they always show you the good stuff 
yeah. yeah which we don't want to do so we're kind of i'm trying to edit around that but it's just meaning that things are taking a little bit longer in terms of editing mm. the behind the scenes just because yeah, I mean, i'll art... get a little bit and then i'll be like oh no that's a spoiler i can't include yeah. that so it's one of those things so like yeah you have to walk with such a fine balance because at the one hand you want to show the good stuff like this is why you want to watch the film this is why you'd be interested but at yeah. the same time if you show your best stuff they're going to walk out and say well that was kind of a bust because i saw everything i wanted to see well, this is why I don't know if you've seen when we released kind of the festival trail of how to come monsters. It's literally 60 seconds. Yeah. And I'm like, the, the kind of gags at the beginning are the same stuff we've shown in the Kickstarter already, just the new versions. And then mm-hmm. all you get from the rest of the film are very cryptic shots mm-hmm. in very short succession of cool stuff happening with no context. Cause yeah. I, I want people to go in and be surprised. Yeah. I don't want, and, and again, I, you completely true. I hate most trailers especially for netflix stuff you feel like you've just watched the whole movie and i'm like oh there's every yes. plot point there's all the character yes. arcs and there's what happens at the end so um, my least favorite for, for trailers i've got to call this out because like this has struck a nerve so amazon so amazon prime like i have prime so i can see like a few things I'm looking at you invincible but you know anyway <laughs> yeah. so am like amazon it will just show you like a random two minute segment of the film you know and it's like these segments can be completely unrelated it's just like we were we don and i were like thinking about watching a thriller right and we wanted to like get the gauge of it because it's like it's a two hour long movie this is an investment for two parents so anyway we're looking at this trailer and it's just like 30 to 45 seconds of like a woman talking to her friend in a coffee shop and we're like this told us nothing <laughs> I, I i think i think i know why those exist as well because as part of the delivery as a filmmaker to amazon you have to submit a trailer that has to be like a minimum i think it's like 60 seconds or something if you mm-hmm. don't i think it just clips a bit of the film <laughs> so well, this I, is because people were lazy yeah yes. i did get that <laughs> <laughs> so it's just like but then i'm like if there's no trailer just don't have one at all i prefer that yeah. to a random clip yeah. from the middle of the movie that makes it look makes me not want to watch it um but editing trailers is hard like i, I spent you are so good at it oh, you edited the trailer and yeah but i spent i spent so weeks editing that trailer because i was like this has to be like get people excited not give anything away get across that it's a fun gory movie that it's 80s inspired but not look low budget but not look too hollywood it's like it's like a weird like this this needs to get across and luckily people seem to like the trailer which is good but yeah it's it's very hard because one if that trailer was bad suddenly people would not be interested Mm -hmm. in seeing how to kill monsters and you know again the trailer when you submit the film to festivals you submit the trailer the poster and the movie they don't have time to watch all these movies. They look at the poster. If they like the poster, they'll watch the trailer. If they like the trailer, they'll watch the movie. If you don't pass those first two tests, they don't even bother watching because no one's going to commit to, oh, I've got to watch an hour and a half now of a terrible poster and a terrible trailer. They're not going to do it. I mean, to be fair, so we have a, we have another co-host, Alex. Um, he is currently uh, going through the rigors of PhD. His apologies for not coming on tonight, but he is he's fighting a battle. But yeah. There's a film, and it's called Legend of the Dinosaurs and Monster Birds. And I find every opportunity to troll Alex about this film. So it has no dinosaurs in it. It has no birds in it. There is a country music solo in the middle of it. And somehow the prehistoric creatures, which look amazing, (laughs) control the weather. Okay. This film <laughs> did not get any better. And the title, the trailer, and the poster are solid gold. But because, you know, our podcast being what it is, I told Alex it was amazing. <laughs> he did into an hour and a half of watching this film. <laughs> and then we do gifts around the holiday season. So what did Alex get? The largest poster I could find <laughs> in the film. Which he hasn't hung up for some reason. No, I, <laughs> but no, but I mean, like, I will say, like, there are a few, like, hidden, you know, diamonds in the rough, you know, Paul and I, who will, you know, watch a film, even if it isn't that way. 
Tammy and the T Rex, another perfect example. I've got that on Blu ray, yeah. That's great. <laughs> so, again, I've referenced Dawn quite a few times in this podcast t- episode. But, anyways, Tammy and the T Rex, that was the point at which I won Dawn over that, like, these low budget films, they aren't necessarily meant to be taken seriously. <laughs> yeah. She watched that and she's just like, that was the first film I could categorically say it was so bad it was good. Yeah. So yeah, that, but... it's it's actually so genius when you think about the plot. Every scene of that movie is so kind of absurdly perfect. Yeah, and I just love that it's yeah, it's Weekend at Bernie's is an evil mad scientist, and Paul Walker's brain is put in a robot dinosaur. It's not a real it's dinosaur. A robot it's a dinosaur. dinosaur. Robot. Yeah. So... <laughs> and that, that telephone scene where the hands put in the coins, it, it's <laughs> like we laugh at that. Oh every so night. did you watch the special features? Tell me you watched the special no, features. No, I've not got around to it yet. I've been busy. <laughs> my yeah, no, my favorite part of this of like that entire Blu-ray set is just like a snippet of dialogue from it. It's like, how did this film get made, you ask? A friend of mine who was like a lorry driver was transporting an animatronic T-Rex. He's like, I'm going to have this T-Rex for like the weekend. Do you want to do anything with it? (laughs) And thus film magic was made. (laughs) Just like, that was the whole thing. They just like, yeah, we got it for, you know, the weekend. You want to make a movie? Sure. And that movie, let me tell you. For the amount of like laughs you get, I cannot believe it was made in like two days. That's crazy. I need to. I, I thought it was over there, but I was like, yeah, I need to get it and watch the uh, the bonus features because bonus features yeah. are mad. They are absolute madness. <laughs> this is again why it's so fun to watch. You know, like creative, low budget films, indie films, because you get stuff like that in the special features, which is again something we're looking forward to in your release. Yeah, I, I hate I hate the way that a lot of major releases are so bare bones, and it's always the same PR featurettes. It's like there's like they'll always have like five three minute long featurettes that were literally made to publicize the movie. They don't give you any kind of like backstory or insight. They're just like the kind of stuff that Warner Brothers puts on the YouTube channel, but they just stick them on the disc, and I'm like. No, I want commentary. I want a uh, grueling behind the scenes that there's like heart of darkness, which <laughs> shows all the things that went wrong. And I want to see people laughing and have fun. And yeah, we got a lot of stuff that we're trying to jam on this disc. I don't know how we're going to fit it all on, no. to be honest. So the Book of Monsters yeah. one's about an hour, over an hour, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, the, the making, the behind the scenes is over an hour long. So it's, yeah, oh. it's technically another movie's worth on yeah. the. On the yeah, how to kill monsters is going to be longer than the movie, probably. <laughs> yeah, I've got to try and figure out how, yeah, how big a disc we can get. Because yeah. <laughs> I know you can get twenty. Because we were originally planning on a twenty-five gig. We're definitely going to have to do dual layer fifty anyway. But then I was like, I've heard James because James Cameron's finally releasing like Aliens on Blu-ray on four K, um, and I've seen that he's pushed them to go for the hundred gig, like. Yikes. quad layer 4k blu-ray because he's like this has to be the best oh, stop quality. drilling stop drilling <laughs> but i'm like how good quite because like obviously you have to compress the film to fit because like as an example uh sorry i'm just being really nerdy now but as an example like the master file for how to kill monsters video is is i think it's about 300 gigabytes if you want like the master 4k oh. file uh, obviously, i had no idea it was that big yeah, well, this is the thing because it's like so uncompressed, so detailed. But obviously, Blu-rays are mostly twenty-five gigs, so you've got to like compress that. You start to lose quality. But James Cameron was apparently just went, "No, nope. I want a hundred gigabytes." Cameron disc. loves his pictures. I'll tell you what. There's yeah, no, there's no arguing with him at this point. Yeah, I can't wait to get it. And the Abyss is coming out like for one day only in the cinema. So, yeah, I've got to drag you to that. <laughs> yeah. Well, unfortunately, we've reached the end of our time slot. But it's been absolutely brilliant talking with the pair of you. So we're looking at Christmas for the release date for How to Kill Monsters. Book of Monsters. We're going to what website to order for Christmas? Uh, Darkrifthorror.com if you're in the UK. If you're in the US, you can head over to epicpictures.com. We have two different other territories that might get it. Or uh, well, but well, Book of Monsters is actually I keep them here for this very reason. Uh, Book, <laughs> Book of Monsters is available in the UK, uh, the USA, um, Japan. Ooh. It's some really cool kind of 
different artwork really on it, cool. which is awesome. Um, it's available in Germany with, again, different artwork with a really cool monster that's definitely not the one in the movie, but it looks cool um, mm. on DVD and Blu-ray as well. So it's it's Book of Monsters is pretty much, if you want a physical copy, you can pretty much get it in any territory, which is good. Are they region locked or can you just order it in the different territories? Um, I ordered them all off Amazon and they all work on my machine. So I don't think they're region locked which is good. Oh, that's really great. So that means anywhere in the world you can watch this film. Yeah. Absolutely brilliant. So there we go. Okay, so we're going to end with everybody's favorite segment, if nothing else. So this is where we recommend media, where we went off on tangents here, or, you know, by all means, do the plug. So, Paul, we'll have you go first, good sir. I mean, I want to see Frogman myself. (laughs) (laughs) um if nothing else um i'm gonna plug another podcast because i was listening to it this week Uh, it's called game scoop and on episode 745 which is their their latest latest one they wow they're committed they look at every godzilla game released from like 1980 through to now and it's only like 40 minutes long but it's just cool to hear some other kaiju fans just talk about gaming so there we go that's my plug um Lindsay, if nothing else. So I'm really bad with watching like horror or monster movies because I get scared by everything. So, um... <laughs> wrong how, how do you really sleep at night? I know, honestly, I'm gonna say, I have to live with this. <laughs> <laughs> I have a great time at festivals when I'm like with loads of people. Yeah, but yeah. If I, I, I struggle watching anything on my own, what can I plug? Shall I just plug our film? Yeah, just do it. Just do it. Go but, for but, it. Book, book of Monsters, which we said, and also How to Kill Monsters, which is obviously on the festival run. So our next festival is in New York. Is that the next one? Uh, no, oh. we've got Italy. Um, we've got uh, San Francisco. We've got um, Canada. Then we've got New York. Right. So we've got four left. Four left. But we're, go- we're going to be going to the one in New York. So Yes. If, if anyone's if coming anyone's to New York, New York City York. Horror Film Festival, we'll be, we'll be there. We'll be there. Nice. So be great to meet okay. you. And what about um, E.T. Miss Campbell? Sorry? Yeah. What about E.T. Miss Campbell? Oh, yeah. To... yeah. So E.T. Miss Campbell should be, yeah, should be coming out soon. It's getting yeah. released. Um, hopefully, yeah, within the next few months. Um, so yeah, that's up with Liam Regan, uh, his company Ref- Ref- Refuse Films or Refuse, or Refuse. Yeah, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Um, but yeah, that should be coming out very soon. Um, so that's kind of been doing the tour around America. Uh, yeah, that's been like doing like double bills with the latest like Lloyd Kaufman stuff. So yeah, yeah, cool. so it played in LA um, last month. So so yeah, it's doing really well. So yeah, eat Miss Campbell as well. Yeah. So what about you? Um. Um, I mean, I've already plugged Frogman. It's not even my film. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like the PR guy for them. That's so um, charitable for you to do that, too. Wow. I mean, I'm, I'm feeling it. I'm feeling the good vibes. Yeah, we all support each other in the indie film realm. We do. Um, but yeah, I honestly, yeah, I, I'm going to plug all the film festivals that we've been to. Like, if you go on howtokillmonsters.com, which is the How to Kill Monsters official website, we've got like a page for all the screenings. Every single film festival this film has been to has been so good. Like, everyone's so nice. And these are all just run by amazing fans of horror movies. Mm-hmm. So, like, the programming at some of them is so much fun. So, like, they'll have, like, a whole, like, afternoon of just monster movies. And you know you're just going to go and get great monster movies. So, yeah, do check out all the festivals we've been to. And I just want to say thanks to all the festivals yes. for having us. Yeah. Because... That is one of the hardest kind of parts of the filmmaking process is getting into film festivals because it means people actually want to see the movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's so yeah. good. How about you? So I'm going to plug a couple of things. Obviously, Book of Monsters, it is the perfect Christmas present. Um, or you know, a holiday present, I guess. We're, you know, we're not we're not judging. Um, and then um we want to see how to kill monsters as soon as possible. So obviously, you know, whenever it comes out, um, Valentine's Day for some folks, you know, by all means, get it. Um, and then we get the signed copy, right? If we order from your website. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. If you yeah. if you get Book of Monsters from our website, it is signed. And I believe if, uh, yeah, depending on which Kickstarter reward you got, you will have a signed version, uh, which I think, this is the thing, it's been so long ago, I can't remember which perk is which, but yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm sure trying to remember which one I went for. <laughs> yeah. like, did I get the signed one or not? I can't remember. Can <laughs> no, I change it? <laughs> Anyways, we want those. Um, one thing I will call out, so um, 
Godzilla minus one is coming out December 15th. It is not coming to all cinemas in the United Kingdom. Um, if you were in another territory uh, and it's out for longer, well, good for you. But in the UK, we don't get nice things. No. So um, please take the opportunity now to check with the local cinema, make plans. Um, in the United Kingdom, we don't necessarily get as many uh, showings for stuff like that. So good showing from the fan base is always appreciated. So check your listings. But yeah, main thing, we need to order Book of Monsters, get a signed copy, and then we need to wait for How to Kill Monsters, which are the main draws. Thank you, right, folks. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> cool. Well, thanks for coming on. Thanks for listening, folks. And as always, keep it kaiju. Mm-hmm.